Please join me for the opening sentences. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us sing together hymn number 450. There is nothing beyond the reach of God's grace and forgiveness within our hearts and lives. We must never be afraid to step into God's presence in confession and humility. God welcomes our approach. And so knowing that, together let us pray the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Most merciful God, forgive us. We imagine that we can live without you instead of recognizing that you give us very breath. We seek control over others rather than strive to live in unity. We allow fear to overtake us rather than remembering that our lives are in your strong and loving hands. Let us now to you in steadfast love, Lord God, and shape us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Let us continue our confession silently and individually.
The scriptures declare this promise that if we present ourselves before God in confession that God is faithful and just to forgive us. In and through Jesus Christ, you and I have been forgiven from the center of our lives outward. Please be seated. <laughs> Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. In the book of Acts, Peter says, the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death by water and the Holy Spirit, and we are made members of his church, the body of Christ joined to Christ's ministry. If anyone wants to know more about baptism, please talk to one of the pastors. On behalf of, se of the session, I present Joy Mansa Archer, daughter of Rebecca Aintree and Peter Conta Archer, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Do you desire that Joy be baptized? If so, say, we do. We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to joy? If so, say, I do. I do. Please stand if you are able. Do we, members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture joy by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ, and to be a faithful member of his church. If so, say we do. We do. Please be seated. Peter and Jackie, I now ask you to reaffirm your faith by answering these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Amen. We give thanks for the gift of water, and we will pray over the water. And I want to mention that in the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, 
before the day of baptism is the naming ceremony. And so we had the naming ceremony yesterday, and it was beautiful. And that's when we learned of Joy's middle name. Let us pray. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. We thank you, O oh God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. From it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who were cleansed by it, raise them to new life, and graft them to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon joy, that she may have power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. Amen. 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 Joy Mansa, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Joy Mansa, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. 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 Let us worship and let us give thanks and let us welcome the newest child of the covenant, Joy Mansa. And we have gifts for you from your church family, and we give thanks for Caleb and Ohenoa, such a wonderful big sister and big brother. God bless you, and God bless joy always. Amen. And now would the children come forward for the time with the children? Come right on up here. Good morning. Okay. You can sit wherever it's comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Nice to have you here. Ivy, we need you. We need a girl up here. It's good. It's good. All right. I, uh, there's a word. It's a, it's a big word. It's reconciliation. I'm going to ask you to say it, and, and maybe we'll get a little bit into what it means. Can you say it with me? Reconciliation. Okay, it has to do with everybody does things wrong, but we need to get beyond that. So I need you to think with me. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to vote on if something I did was a good thing to do or a bad thing to do, okay? So first thought, um, I hit my brother. Good thing to do or bad thing to do? I got 
Oh, my, my husband says it's a bad thing to do. Okay, we got, we got one renegade, but uh, basically, bad thing to do. Okay, now listen. He told me, hit me as hard as you can, and so I hit him. Good thing to do or bad thing to do? Or I may have swayed one, yeah, okay, we've we got a couple who are on the fence. It's still a bad thing to do. He got under my skin and I hauled off and hit him. Um, what if he's older and bigger? No, we're not gonna go there. Um, it's a bad thing to do. Another thought, I said something bad about my friend. I said something mean. Good thing to do or bad thing to do? Okay, we, we've got one assertive person over here. Couple undecided. It's a bad thing to do. Yeah, okay. Maybe I could have just kept my mouth closed. What if I said something bad about her that was true? Good thing to do or bad thing to do? Ooh, you guys are speedy. Right, it didn't need to be said. I didn't have to say it. It was a bad thing to do. Um, what if the next day I went up to my friend and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't need to say that. Good thing to do or bad thing to do? We got some contrarians here. Most, most, <laughs> mostly, most are on script. Yeah, it, it was a good thing to do. It took a little bit of, of nerve to say, I was wrong, I was mean, and I didn't have to be mean. How do you think that worked on our friendship? Friendship is over, or friendship is going back into place? Okay, one says, yeah, friendship, French, I got a this. So that means the friendship needs a little bit of time to get better. How can I make that friendship back into a friendship? What, what can we do to make that better? Hmm. Sometimes you just keep trying. Sometimes you do something together, you, you get something fun to play together with, and then you start to have good times together and the good memories help to wipe out the bad memory. That's part of this crazy word, reconciliation. So I want you to say the word again, reconciliation. Okay, it means making things better. Now the only reason we have any hope at reconciling a friendship is because God forgives us. So when I punch my brother or when I say something mean about my friend, I need God's forgiveness, and I need the forgiveness of the other person. Presbyterians know that we need God's forgiveness a whole lot of the time. So every time we come to church on Sunday, there's a prayer of confession. And in smaller words, the prayer of confession means, I am sorry, God, I made mistakes. And God loves us. God loves us like a father or a mother, and God wants to forgive us. Because of Jesus Christ, we get forgiveness when we ask for it. So you all, when you go out into, the, into your neighborhood or during the school year when you go back to school, you are people who get to do reconciliation. You are on the side of rebuilding friendships and making relationships good. God wants you to be part of Jesus' work in the world. Let's say a prayer. Gracious God, thank you that you forgive us. We need your forgiveness every day. Thank you that you can give us eyes to see when we have made mistakes, and you give us courage to say, I am sorry, I was wrong. Send us out as people who belong to you, who renew friendships. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attention.
Let us pray. O oh God, who calls us by your mysterious power, speak to us your truth and show us your wisdom, that we may know you more deeply, serve you more faithfully, and love you always. Amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The prophet Samuel is called by God to go and anoint a new king of Israel. Hear God's word for us. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely his anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ready, and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out to Ramah, the word of the Lord.
let the church say amen. 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 Thank you. Our next reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was called the invisible gorilla experiment. It's a great name, isn't it? Researchers from Harvard and from the University of Illinois made a video for it. And the video went viral. The video simply showed six people walking around chaotically and passing a basketball back and forth. People were asked to watch carefully and silently count how many times they passed that basketball. I watched and counted. Then I was asked, did you see the gorilla? What gorilla? I asked, there was no gorilla, but they passed that ball 15 times. Then I was told, watch the video again. Unbelievable. Sure enough, a man in a gorilla suit walked into the middle of what was going on, beat his chest three times, and then walked off. He was in the video for nine seconds, and I never saw him. In fact, half of the people who watch this video never see him. Selective attention, it's called. We often see what we expect to see, what we're focusing on seeing, and there's a lot we miss. Maybe then we shouldn't be so shocked by that story of the prophet Samuel. Samuel and Jesse, it turns out, are looking but not seeing. Samuel has been sent by God to anoint a new king of Israel. Did you notice where he is sent? Bethlehem. This is part of a much larger story. It includes Ruth from last Sunday. Faithful choices that Ruth and Samuel and others make lead to the birth of the Messiah, Jesus. Faithful choices make that possible. 
Samuel comes to Bethlehem, and he and the city elders are terrified. If Saul, the current king, finds out what's happening here, they could all be killed. But Samuel does as God instructed. He invites the elders and Jesse and Jesse's sons to worship. Now comes the hard part. Which one is the son that God has chosen? Jesse sends the first, the eldest of his seven sons, to pass before Samuel. And Samuel looks and sees a tall, strong, handsome young man, and he's convinced this is the one. This is the man God has chosen to be king. But Samuel's wrong. God says to him, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Seven times, Samuel looks and thinks, this has got to be the one. And seven times, God says, no. Finally, Samuel asks Jesse, are these all your sons? And one translation puts Jesse's response this way. Well, there's the runt, but he's out tending the sheep. The runt. Jesse just can't see it. And Samuel can't see it either until they're forced by the process of elimination. God has chosen the runt. Samuel and Jesse have been so focused on the wrong things, on outward appearance, the basketball passes, if you will. They've missed seeing the heart, the character, the faith, the gorilla. They've been looking but not seeing. The Lord does not see as we see. Madeline Lengel, the beloved Christian author, puts it beautifully when she writes, we each have a point of view. Only God has view. I've been thinking about the surprises in the scriptures. Again and again, people miss seeing the gorilla, the gorilla that's right there. It's invisible because people are focused on the wrong things. These are stories of God seeing, God noticing, God surprising everyone by choosing the runt. Think of Jacob and Joseph and Jeremiah and David, runts, small ones who seem too young to even notice. But God notices and God chooses. Think of Moses, who tried to turn down his call from God to lead because he wasn't a good speaker. But God chooses and uses Moses. Moses reminds the people of Israel near the end of his life that they too are a surprise. Moses says to them, it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Of course, the surprises don't stop there. I think of those disciples Jesus chose, fishermen, 
tax collectors. If they had been the best and the brightest, they would have been disciples already. A rabbi would have chosen them and been training them. But Jesus chose them and loved them. Jesus saw something in them that others didn't see. Jesus sees the gifts of a Samaritan woman at a well. A woman who has had five husbands, she's an outcast to her community. But Jesus sees her and loves her, and she becomes an evangelist, pointing people to Jesus. And then there's Zacchaeus. Jesus surprises everyone, including the tax collector Zacchaeus himself, by choosing to come to his home and honor him. And Zacchaeus becomes a new man, a generous, joyful child of God in the process. And perhaps the biggest shocker of all is that Jesus calls Paul, a man who has been hunting down and killing followers of Jesus. Paul becomes a follower of Jesus himself and an extraordinary one at that. That's God's grace at work, isn't it? It doesn't end with the many examples in the Bible. God chooses you. God sees you, sees the great potential in you, the gifts in you. What's more, that changes you. It changes the way you see yourself and the way you see others. By God's grace, you begin to see with God's eyes. I'll never forget the story of a teenager who wanted to talk to a pastor after worship. The young man was haunted by the suffering in the world and wondered where was God in all of the tragedies. But the pastor didn't really see that young man, didn't notice and take time to talk about the hard questions. The pastor said, Steve, you're too young to understand. And Steve walked away from church and never came back. Maybe you've heard of Steve. His last name was Jobs, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. Imagine if that conversation had gone differently. Imagine if the pastor and the congregation had seen that young man and loved him and supported him in asking important questions. It seems like a long time ago now, but on April 20th, we built the walls for a Habitat for Humanity house right out there on our church's front lawn. I recently recounted the number of volunteers. We had 135 people building walls and 15 teams. And in all of that fun and activity, God's spirit was at work in many ways, but I want to highlight one in particular. One of our team leaders had a young, inexperienced group of volunteers, and so when he went to get his first set of blueprints for a wall, he said, please give me an easy wall, because I've got a group of beginners. But by the end of the morning, he went and he said, give me the hardest wall you have, because my team has learned so much so quickly. The team leader told me about a young girl 
who was on his team. He said, she started out by holding the hammer halfway up and just tap, tap, tapping the nail. It took forever just to start getting that nail into the wood. That man looked at her. And he didn't just look, he saw her. And he said, I can see that you are someone who doesn't give up. You have a wonderful gift. And she beamed. That saying blessed her. And by the end of the day, she was hammering like a pro. <laughs> Seeing others with God's eyes, it's powerful. It opens doors. It unlocks gifts. It blesses you and blesses others. The Apostle Paul writes, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Paul knows from personal experience, seeing with God's eyes changes you and changes others. I'm reminded of a young girl who was starting a new mission outreach ministry. And she could tell people looked at her and thought, she's too little. But that girl looked everyone in the eye and then said, don't worry, I'm much bigger on the inside. Paul goes on to remind us, as Presbyterian pastor and author Eugene Peterson puts it, God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what God is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us. On this Father's Day, I've been thinking about an old movie. It's called Field of Dreams. Have you seen it? I watched it, and I watched the special features, and, and I was surprised to see it was interviewing major league baseball players, and they were talking about their dads. And many of them were weeping as they remembered how their dads spent hours playing catch with them. God used that time. Those dads made the time and took the time. And God used those dads to help those growing children know that they were seen, that they were worth that time and attention, that they were loved, that they mattered. I don't know how your father sees you or saw you, but I do know how your heavenly father sees you. God says through the prophet Isaiah, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. May you see yourself that way, with gifts that others haven't seen and maybe you have not yet seen. And may you do the prayerful work to see others that way too, because we all are bigger on the inside. Thanks be to God. 
Amen. You may be seated. This morning we, we gather together many, many prayers, um, some joys and some concerns. We ask your continuing prayers of sympathy for Karen Clark grieving her mother, um, Sue Clark, who died on May 17th. A visitation will be held at Rutherford Corbin Funeral Home on Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m., and her funeral will be here on Friday morning at 11. Please continue to pray for Larry Case, grieving his wife, Nancy. We ask God's healing for Rick Rasberg, Christina Brune Horrigan, and Bob Steele. We celebrate June anniversaries, June brides, June um, anniversaries. Those who are 50 years or longer are Colleen and Dan Foley, Dave and Nancy Wilson, Karen and Arnie Ishizuka, Betsy and Mark Seneff, and Diane and Dick Schock will be celebrating their 59th. And we have a less than 24-hour anniversary for Sarah Aldinger and Adam Vicari, who were married here yesterday. Let us pray. God of grace and love. Thank you for bringing us to worship this morning. Thank you for opening your word to us and enfolding us in the presence of brothers and sisters in faith. Thank you for the gift of this day and the countless blessings we take for granted. Thank you for loving us with a Father's love. Thank you for the fathers who have blessed us and thank you for men who step in when fathers are not available. Thank you for all who love the next generation, who teach, who show gentle strength and enduring love. 
Thank you for tenderness when we need it and a challenge when we are heading the wrong way. Holy God, we pray that you would wrap this world in your love. We pray for peace even where it seems impossible. We pray for embattled nations. We pray for constructive conversations in all levels of government, local and state and national and international. We remember this week, Juneteenth, and we recognize that the history of slavery in our nation is not simply erased. Make us a nation that lives into justice for all. We ask your protection for your most vulnerable. We thank you for the children and the youth of this church. Thank you for the women and men and teens who give their time to mentor them, befriend them, teach, and support. We celebrate Peggy's birthday on Wednesday, and we pray that you would make us tender-hearted as you are. You gave yourself to save us. Show us where you need us to be. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for making the most of our efforts to love. Love you. Hear us now as we join with all who follow Christ, praying together as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers come forward? God has poured into our lives grace upon grace. Let us make our offerings of thanks and praise. Let us present our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, bless these gifts that are in the offering plates, that they might give glory to you. Bless the lives that we live this week, that we too might speak your praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now go forth to march in the light of God, knowing that you are seen by God and loved and chosen and gifted. And may the grace of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.